if you learn to look through that, what it means is it's not saying that God is a he only, and it's not saying that only males are sons of God. The idea is that we are all the sons and daughters, the expressions of God. And so love, this, this one love, not different kinds, but the same energy of movement of creativity and life itself that moves from the painter to the canvas, that moves from the parent to the child, that moves from the protester to the sign, to the, you know, bringing love to our world. It's one love, and it's the heart of God. And it is also our heart. There's something in this kind of love which is, it is effective, it moves, it creates, it changes things. And it's in all of us. Not only is it in us, it is our truest name. It is who and what we are. Ernest Holmes gave a beautiful definition for love. I love this. Love is the self-givingness of spirit into its creation. The self-givingness of spirit into its creation. So we are a non-dual tradition. We're going to get a little sciencey for just a minute. Most um, Christian churches have a more dualistic understanding that there is God and then there's everything else that's not God, that's separate from God. Even though there's, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there are, there are many mystical un- people and traditions that have understood that there actually is no separation. That, and when Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And there is a there is a great understanding that that Christ mind is in all of us. We are all connected to God. Now, here's where it gets kind of sciencey and tricky. There's only one thing happening, only one presence, only one life. And when we talk about it, we're usually talking about it like it's a separate thing, like I'm looking at it. And what we're really teaching in unity is so radical And it's exactly what the Hindus have always known. It's what the Buddhists have always known, that there is one presence, one life, and we are it, and it is us. One life. And so when we're talking about it, God, it's us. The best way I have been able to say it so that it doesn't sound like we're being all full of ourselves is, I'm not all that God is, but all that I am is God. There is no separation between me and the divine, between me and the Holy Spirit. It is living itself through me. In science, um, just in the creation of this universe, we now know that this universe is part of an infinite multiverse. And that's just talking about the physical aspect of spirit. But it is an infinite amount. The way this universe started was with uh, what? The big bang. You guys are good. Before the Big Bang, what existed in this universe? Nothing, actually, but a singularity. And here, like this is like an image. I googled an image for a singularity, and you can't picture one. Because here's the thing. We're seeing this thing that's set inside of space, but there was no space for it to be inside of. The singularity had space and time inside of it. There was nothing outside of it, and it was infinitely small. And something happened where it became. And everything we know came from something that is infinitely small, that, that was that was not inside of space or time. I know it. That's what happens to my head when I try and think about it too much. And why does that matter? Because this is love. It is the very fabric of reality. There is something that God could have just been its own beautiful one thing with no differentiation and no... And in, and in uh, the Eastern traditions, it's sometimes called the void or nirvana. It's this idea that there is the formless, nameless, as I sang about in the song, but for some Reason it wants to re- be revealed in form as Maxie and as Jenny. It wants to be revealed as a Joey, as a Dooney. It wants to have the experience and expression of infinite forms, but it's still one. The Tao, 
another Eastern tradition, has a beautiful way of teaching this. Just hang on. We're getting really big picture, but I promise I'm going to bring it back to your own heart in just a, if, within 20 minutes. Trust me. We're, gonna, we're going on a journey. This is chapter 42 of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. The Tao begot one. One begot two. Two begot three. And three begot the 10,000 things. The 10,000 things carry yin and embrace yang. They achieve harmony by combining these forces. That's all I want to read. This teaching is that one presence, one life, it's one thing. But it reveals itself in yin and yang, the two. Polarity, hot, cold, up, down, left, right, inside, outside. The only way that God can experience itself is by having contrast. And so everything in the physical universe is an expression of God being in relationship with itself. And so we have masculine, feminine. We have all of these polarities. But if, I love this symbol because it shows us that it's one thing with two aspects. And if you look inside, the, the white is a, spark, part, a circle of the dark. Inside the dark is a circle of the white. And this is actually the three. It said that this thing, this called the yin-yang, is the third thing that is created. And from this, the 10,000. From this movement into time and space and form of up and down and polarity and all of that, that is what creates infinite, inf infinite? <laughs> I got my emphasis on the wrong syllable. The infinite expression of God's wonderful self. And that's you. And that's me. And that's the Grand Tetons. And that's the Andromeda Galaxy. That is the way that God loves by expressing. You are a love letter from God to its own self. You are an expression of nothing but pure divine love. It's who and what you are. No pressure. <laughs> so there are two questions I want us to be with tonight. How many of you have gotten this idea that giving and receiving are really the same thing? We teach it, but have you ever experienced it? Have you ever been in that flow and when you're writing your tithe check, it feels like you're getting a present? If you haven't, stick around. <laughs> and I'm not saying it feels that way every time, <laughs> you know, because sometimes I'm, like, I'm looking at the bills too, but there is. I have had that experience, the mystical experience of understanding that giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. And it's, a, it's part of the yin and the yang, right? It's part of the, the up and the down, the masculine and the feminine. There is part of us that wants to give, and there's part of us that wants to receive. And so the first question when we're talking about the love of your life is, what are you giving yourself to? What are you giving your time and your attention to? Because that is where you're good, that's where you're putting the love of your life. So if you're putting your time and attention on your own unworthiness, if you're putting your time and attention on others' unworthiness, if you're putting your time and your attention on making other people wrong, that's how you're spending the love of your life. Are you feeling guilty yet? We do a little bit of guilt here, just enough. <laughs> just, just, just the right amount. Somebody once told me that we need enough guilt and shame to keep ourselves from running naked through Eckerd's. I don't know if that's, a, if that's true, but... We don't have Eckerd's anymore, but uh, anyway. Okay. So I've got a couple of more questions under this question about how you're expressing, what are you giving yourself to in life? Are you giving yourself to your authentic expression or are you playing image management? Ooh. You, do, you are not required to answer this question out loud. <laughs> I'm reading an interesting book. I've actually taken a class on the book um, called Righteous Mind um, by uh, Haight. Yeah, Howard, not Howard, but Haight. And Cindy Wigglesworth is teaching a class down at the Jung Center on this book as part of our Healing the Heart of America series. We're, um, we're partnered with them on this, this book. And we are wired. We have evolutionarily, as a human species, we have come to be very sensitive to, the other, to people's opinions of us, and it's had a very 
good evolutionary effect because it's kept people doing the right thing and it's allowed us to function together in society and in groups. But there is a paradox here that while we are hardwired to be sensitive to what people think of us, the way to spiritual growth and the way to fulfillment is to express authentically even when people don't like it. Or is that just me? Is that, is that my path? You guys don't have to do that. And there are times that we, in order to, to be who we are called to be authentically, we have to do things, say things, and people don't like it. That's not who they wanted us to be. Sometimes we have to get honest about some struggles we've had, and people don't like to hear about our struggle. In spiritual community, it's different. What we are doing in this spiritual community is we're creating a safe space for authentic expression. Amen. That we're creating a space where we get to have the laboratory the, to experiment with showing up as who we truly are. Joey Hurst, you're my hero in this regard. Someone who has made a bold claim for his authentic expression, right, Joey? Congratulate Joey. He became an uncle this week, a little Carson. And I feel partly responsible for that baby because I married his sister and her husband. So, uh. <laughs> The other thing I want to ask you um, about authentic expression and what are you giving yourself to, here's, here's a clue that I have found as to whether or not you're giving yourself to your authentic expression or maybe image management is this. When you give your love, when you give your energy, do you feel fulfilled or depleted? Now, you can feel tired and fulfilled. <laughs> I will guarantee you, you can feel tired and fulfilled, but not depleted. This is that whole giving and receiving paradox, that when you're giving your gift, at the end, you may be physically, even energetically, tired, but there is a feeling of, I'm doing what I came here to do. It feels good. There is a sense of fulfillment. And often what we, what Mike, I love Michael Beckwith's little turns of phrases, he said, what many of us seek is a feeling of fulfillment. <laughs> we go out in the world trying to find this stuff that will make us feel full, the cute new boyfriend, the brand new car, the pretty new house, all of those things, and we, and we think that that will make us feel finally like we're supposed to be and all it does is it makes us feel full but it doesn't fulfill us you don't become fulfilled by getting anything you become fulfilled by giving who you are bruce is singing a song next week a stevie wonder song love loves in need of love today fabulous song should have had you sing it tonight because that would have been like so right on it'll be great but that's what we're really talking about that that love is needing its authentic expression through all of us because that's how we become fulfilled and that's how we help humanity. You know, I've, I've talked a lot about my spiritual exemplars, my heroes, and I keep coming back to Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, who so powerfully gave all he had for love. And the, the change, not only did it affect the, the laws that were, um, the unjust laws that have been corrected and we're still working on um, creating more justice in our society, but even all these years after his assassination, his words move me. His love is still giving. It's eternal. And that's how it is for all of us, maybe not in such a dramatic way. So the next thing, we've been talking about this giving, and we've got to give to be fulfilled, but we want to talk about receiving. How many were here last week for Mel Melinda Wood's talk? Wasn't that fabulous? It was online? Yeah, she's really great. And she talked about our willingness to receive. How do you feel when somebody gives you a compliment? Do you go, thank you? Or do you go, oh, this old thing? I really need a haircut. I really do need a haircut, by the way. But uh, anyway, but you know what I mean? It's like we have a hard time receiving. Are you willing to receive? Are you willing to let God love you through the people in your church? You've got to let us see you first. 
You got to introduce yourself. I know I see some of you sit in the back and you sneak out before you don't even have a cookie. You're just like, you got to stick around a little bit. I noticed on Sunday, um, we had about, like I said, we have 800 individuals who volunteer in this church in a, in a one year's time, 81,000 hours. We could not operate. We couldn't offer the programs we offer without people giving of their time and service. But what I've noticed is those who are here a lot, who volunteer a lot, they are getting the most out of this church. Charmaine, I'm looking at you. (laughs) She's in our choir. She's in our hospitality team. She's a oneness blessing giver. She's all over the place. She lives in the pyramid. (laughs) She has a little cubby back here. And this woman loves this church, don't you? Now I put you on the spot. She's like, well, it's okay. (laughs) But that's how it works. When you you put yourself out there, then you're open to receive the gift. All right. So there's a passage in Scripture that I want to use to close tonight. This is the words of Jesus in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Can I get an amen? Amen. You know, and that's usually where we stop in this passage. Just ask for what you want. Believe you got it. Great. That's the law of mind action as we teach it in unity. It's that if you saw the secret, it's the same principle. The secret ain't anything new. That's what Jesus was talking about 2,000 plus years ago. That our belief, there's something in the universe that responds to our belief and our request. But this next part is a secret. This is a secret code. He says this, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. In a dualistic tradition... We have this idea of there's a, le- there's a set of rules and you've got to do it right or you make God mad. I think that what the old sin salvation model is pointing to, it's from a, it's an angle, we don't talk about it from that angle, but they're really, they're talking about the same thing, that there is a block when we are outside of our authentic nature, when we're withholding our authentic being, when we're playing image management instead of giving our authentic self, we create a block in our giving and receivingness. Remember what Ernest Holmes said love is? The givingness of God, the givingness of spirit. That when we are not in alignment with our truth, we are blocked. And one of the ways, probably the primary way, that we block our good in both giving and receiving is unforgiveness. It gets quiet when I start talking about this. <laughs> that there is some judgment we have of some person, and they're less than God, less than good, less than the divine, perfect expression of God, love's own nature. I know you don't do that. Other people do that. <laughs> they might even look at the other political party and have less than loving feelings. We don't do that. And where do we do it most? Looking in the mirror. We can look at ourselves and and it's so easy to see less than God's perfect love. I heard a a talk last night. It was at the Jung Center's Benefit at the River Oaks Country Club. Very fancy. And... uh, the speaker was talking about he was, uh, he was recovered from body dysmorphic disorder. And if you don't know what that is, it's where you look in the mirror and you see something you perceive to be a flaw and it becomes the only thing you see. We all have some, some on some scale of spiritual dysmorphic disorder. But unless you're looking at your own life and your own reflection and seeing the love of God in form, you have forgiveness work to do. What does Edwin Gaines say? Here's the test to see if you have forgiveness work to do. Do you have a body? (laughs) And it is your, your unforgiveness, your unwillingness to see others and yourself as the perfect expression of God's own nature that keeps you from receiving the love of God.
And let me tell you, it is being showered all around you all the time. All the time. But we see what we look for. We see through the lens of our belief. And so our work, and it is work, I will not lie to you. It is work to take up these spiritual practices, these spiritual principles, and live them day in, day out, week in, week out. And that's why we do it in community, so we can lift each other up. I had a little gift come from Sandy Zavoyan, one of our bookstore staffers, and I think they sell these here. It's a little love card, like a fortune cookie. You open it up, and this is what it said to me. As I was preparing this talk, I opened it yesterday. Ralph Waldo Emerson, give all to love, obey thy heart. What you have to offer us in terms of your authentic expression is exactly what we need. Give all you have to love and you will be met a hundredfold. God bless you. Thank you.